We hope you'll be blessed and inspired and challenged and motivated by this fresh word from Christian Heritage Church. John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. The Bible says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So in the first two verses, Jesus clarifies what the Feast of the Tabernacles is really all about. It's about allowing living water to flow through our hearts and our lives. And he said the only prerequisite to receive that living water is you've got to be thirsty and you've got to come to me. If you're thirsty for more of God, will you shout amen this morning? If you're ready to come to him and receive all that he has for you, will you shout, that's me this morning? Let God do something great in your life. Then John in verse 39 adds a parenthetical statement, simply saying, explaining what Jesus was talking about, that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, go to Acts chapter 2, you'll see that fulfillment. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with living water. And it will flow out of you like a mighty rushing river. So let me ask you, how many of you are filled with the Holy Spirit? How many of you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? How many of you need to be refilled again with the Holy Spirit? You see, Jesus is making it clear, and John clarifies that you and I need to understand when we come to God, it's not just religion as normal and routine. It's not just three songs, an offering, and a quick prayer, and a message in between. It's experiencing a living God that opens life to us, and that life begins to flow through us so that those around us experience the same God that we know. See, that's really what it's all about. He talked about a river of living water flowing from your heart. It's not meant to be dammed up in your heart. It's not meant to be contained in your heart, but rather the river of the Holy Spirit that flows through God's believers is intended to touch those around them. Last week we talked about Ezekiel chapter 47 and the river that flows from the throne of God. And everywhere it goes, it provides life and it provides healing. Oh, come on, folks. Do you understand that analogy is of the Holy Spirit flowing through our lives and his desire, his desire, his desire is not that you be able to speak in tongues. It's not that you have a word of knowledge. It's not that you operate in the gifts of discernment. His desire is that living water flow from your being so that the people around you see something, experience something they've never seen before, and they say, I'm thirsty too. Come on, that's what it's all about. So many times we think, well, we come to church, we do the same thing all the time. We turn the lights down, we worship, we turn the lights up, we take an offering, we turn the lights down, we worship some more, then pastor preaches, then he says amen and we go home. Folks, it's wrong. I'm not saying orders of service are wrong. God is not a God of chaos, he's a God of order. But I am saying, if that's our expectation of what we experience when we walk through the door, it's wrong. Every time we come to this place, we should expect to receive and experience the supernatural presence of a living God. That's God's desire. Listen, all of my words can't convert a soul. All of my preaching will not persuade anyone to turn to Jesus outside of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. But when Holy Spirit comes in and comes down, it takes my words to a whole nother level. It pierces men's hearts and lives so they hear and they receive the word of life. So they walk out not bound in sin, not bound in addiction, not bound in fear. But they walk out saying, I have the spirit of adoption. I am a son of God. I am a child of God. I am an heir with Jesus, a joint heir with Jesus. And everything that heaven affords is mine today. See, that should be the goal. Not just, well, you know, I've got to go to church this Sunday morning because that's what I do and that's what expect, is expected of me. If that's the reason you're coming, stay home. Well, I've never heard anyone, a pastor say stay home. 
I'm telling you, if that's the only reason you're coming, stay home, sleep in. You'll get more out of it than you'll get here. But if you will come with an expectation, if you will come with a heart that says, God, there's more than I have ever received. I know that you're going to pour into me divine impartation today. You're going to speak into my spirit today. You're going to encourage, increase my power today. You're going to increase my faith today. If you come with that attitude, I've got news for you. You don't even want to leave because you've experienced God. You've been touched by his power, his grace, and his mercy. Jesus said, if any man is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, out of his heart, shall flow rivers of living water. So we've talked about this for three previous Sundays. We can't afford to be average. Average doesn't get us where God wants us to go. Average doesn't reach the world that God wants to reach. Average doesn't turn men's heart toward the cross. We have to be normal. Normal by the New Testament standard. Full of the fire of the Holy Ghost. Full of a dynamic witness. Being willing to put ourselves between men and women and a certain damnation to hell if they don't accept Christ as their Savior. We have got to be normal, not average. And when we begin living that way, living in the overflow, results occur. Last week we talked about when we live in the overflow, we live in community. If you weren't here, go to chctoday.com, watch it, or download the podcast and listen to it. You need to hear that message because God wants us to live in community. Today we're going to talk about two more things. Number one, when we live in the overflow, we boldly proclaim the gospel. Has anyone noticed that the gospel is the furthest thing from so many churches today? We talk about everything but the gospel. What does gospel mean? It means good news. We talk about everything but the good news. We talk about politics. We talk about religion. We talk about man's opinion. We talk about how do we raise money for this group or that group or another group. When in reality, our sole task is to proclaim the gospel. That's it. And it's not my task alone. Yes, it is my task, both personally and corporately. But it's our task to proclaim the gospel. None of us are exempt. Acts chapter 2, verses 40 and 41. The Bible says these words, and with many other words that they testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. It's talking about Peter and James and John and Matthew and Bartholomew and down through the list. The 120 that were in the upper room that day, gladly proclaiming the word, exhorting those who were listening to turn to Jesus Christ. They boldly proclaimed the gospel. Where were they doing this? They were doing it in the temple. Isn't that a place of great risk? Absolutely. But they went back to the very people who hung their Savior on the cross, who took his very life, and they proclaimed, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. He did die. You killed him, as a matter of fact. But on the third day, he rose again from the dead. So we are going to boldly proclaim the gospel. Boldly proclaim. I am not going to apologize for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Paul said. He didn't say, I'm not going to apologize. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, when we're ashamed of something, we're always apologizing for it. I'm not going to apologize that all men are born sinners, that all men need a Savior, that there's only one Savior and His name is Jesus. I'm not going to apologize that there aren't multiple roads into heaven. There's only one. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Jesus Christ. I'm not going to apologize. It's time we boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. John Wesley wrote, you have one business on earth to save souls. C.T. Studd wrote these words, some wish to live within the sound of a church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. God, change our perspective. Change our perspective. Help us understand we are here to boldly proclaim the gospel. 
We aren't going to water it down. We aren't going to back down. It doesn't matter who likes it or who doesn't. If it says it in the book, we're going to believe it and proclaim it. Amen? We're going to boldly proclaim the gospel. We're not going to pollute the word to accommodate our culture. That's what many have done. They polluted the word of God to accommodate the culture. And as a result, they've lost the presence and the power of the living God. We aren't going to wink and turn a blind eye towards sin. We will still declare men are sinners who need a Savior. We are going to declare as Paul of old, woe is me if I preach not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's time to declare to our city, to our region, to our nation, and to our world, we will boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's time to say and not be ashamed, we are a spirit-filled, Holy Ghost-driven church, and we're going to do what God's called us to do. That's to reach this city for Jesus Christ. We're going to do what he's asked us to do. We're going to declare we are a church who believes in the inspired, infallible, authoritative word of the living God. This isn't just words about God. It is the word of God. And we're going to take our stand on the word of God because the word brings life and brings transportation, transformation. We are going to be the type of people in the type of church that says we still believe in that old rugged cross. We still believe in a virgin birth. We still believe in the sinless life of Jesus Christ. We still believe he died as a substitute for your sins and for mine. And oh, folks, we still believe that one Sunday morning he came out of that grave and he is no longer dead, but he is alive. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus came to save sinners. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we didn't even know we needed a Savior, God provided a way. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you hear what I'm saying to you today? It's time to lift up the gospel message. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Oh, come on, folks. Get it in your spirit. You hold a treasure. You contain words of life. Let the rivers of living water begin to flow and boldly proclaim the gospel. Boldly proclaim the gospel. To all those around you. You see, when we embrace the overflow and live in the overflow, then Jesus' commission becomes our mission. You say, I don't understand that. I don't know what you're talking about. Matthew chapter 28. They're going to put it on the screen for you. If you've never heard these verses, hear them then for the first time. Matthew 28, 18 and 19, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's his commission, and it becomes our mission when we live in the overflow. Suddenly, we can't stand the thought of somebody we know and love and care about, or even a total stranger we've never met, dying and going to a devil's hell. You see, we have so polluted the gospel of Jesus Christ that many don't even believe in heaven and hell. We're all going someplace and it's all going to be okay and we'll sit in a circle and hold hands and sing kumbaya. I'm not going to that place. I'm going to a heaven where I've got a mansion waiting. The streets are paved with gold. I live in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and rule and reign with Him forever and ever and ever. Oh, come on, folks, get it in your spirit. It's about eternity. And the battles we wage, the reason we proclaim the gospel is to change people's eternity. Not that we can do it, but the gospel we proclaim can accomplish that. So his mission, his commission becomes our mission. In just a few weeks, Pastor Mike's going to be telling you what we're doing this summer. He's calling it Love Tallahassee. And we're going to spend time in July doing just that thing, showing the love of Jesus to our city, proving to them the church just isn't about coming once a week, let us take your money, and then you go home. Heavens no. Church is about being Jesus with skin on so people can see him through us and experience living 
water. I'm excited about it. You're going to pray now for love, Tallahassee. It's going to be a dynamic and a powerful time. Someone said to me, why are you letting Yvonne go to Africa by herself? Because she isn't going by herself. The Holy Spirit of the living God is accompanying her. He's making the way before her. I will not allow fear to dominate her life nor yours. So stop talking that way and begin praying for the river of living water to flow so that hundreds and thousands of children in Kenya see Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Come on, folks. We are backwards in our thinking. We don't understand that the gospel has risks. We have to take those risks in order to see the reward. If you're not willing to open your mouth because you're afraid somebody will ridicule you, you'll never see the reward of leading someone to Christ. If you're not willing to speak up in a public forum because someone might call you down or shut you down, you'll never see the reward of seeing people turn to Jesus Christ. I'm challenging you this morning. Let his commission become your mission. Understand when you live in the overflow, you live to bring men and women to Jesus Christ. You live to see destinies altered and eternities changed by the power of the living God. Matter of fact, if we live in the overflow, then our mission to reach all men by all means is really too small. It's really too small. I don't know how to phrase it to make it bigger. Someone who is a marketing guru or genius needs to do that. But I'm saying it's too small. Love Tallahassee is too small. Going to Africa is too small. Sending missions teams across the world is too small. When we understand we live in the overflow, the Spirit of God flows through our life. He wants to do so much more than we can ever begin to imagine or think. Matter of fact, when we understand that, then I have every right, no, let me rephrase that. I have every responsibility to challenge you and I to fill this building this year. When we understand His commission is our mission, when we live in the overflow, and we understand living water flows from us to those around us, then we have to accept the challenge to fill this place this year. Think about it. If you just reach two people this year, this auditorium is full. The children's church is full. The nursery is overflowing. By the way, if you want to work in the nursery or kid power, you need to go talk to them today because they need your help. So step up, let the water, living, living water flow from your being and touch some kids for Jesus today. Do something in that nature. Allow God to move into you. We need to understand when we live in the overflow, the great commission is then our plans are too small for what God wants to do in and through our lives. It's kind of like if you had a cure for cancer, would you share it? Just a quick survey. How many of you have ever had cancer in this room? Slip your hand up. Let me see it. Hold it up high. Let everybody see it. There's several, several of you, a lot of you in this place today. You've walked through that experience. If I had a cure for cancer and I walked up to you and just prayed for you but didn't give you the cure... I'd be doing you an injustice, wouldn't I? If I had a cure for cancer, I'd want to go into every oncology ward on every hospital. I'd want to go to every hospice service at every home. I'd want to talk to every cancer doctor and say, I've got the cure. It's yours. And here's the good news. It's free. Amen. Well, can I tell you, sin is a cancer. And it's a cancer that kills. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So sin is a cancer, and it always brings the same result. It kills. So you and I need to understand, we have the cure, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the message of the gospel. Why wouldn't we share that with everyone we know? I don't want to be pushy. And they boldly proclaim the gospel. I don't want to be considered a Jesus freak. Well, what do you want to be considered, a television freak? You see, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What are you talking about every day? What's flowing from you? Because if you are talking about Jesus to those who are lost, you got the wrong source flowing into your spirit. Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me a drink. And from his heart shall flow rivers of living water. See, life should be flowing from you and me on an everyday basis. Jesus is the cure. 
When we live in the overflow, Jesus builds his church. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says, and 3,000 were added to the Lord. Acts chapter 4, verse 4 says, another 5,000 were added to the church. Acts chapter 19, verse 10, it says, all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord. Can I tell you, there are folks living within a stone's throw of this place who don't have an understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are people all around us in Tallahassee who have not heard the good news. Oh, they've heard what churches say, but they haven't heard the good news. They don't understand. Jesus isn't about religion. He's about reorganizing, revamping, transforming everything that's in you and making it new. Oh, come on, church. When we understand we live in the overflow, Jesus builds his church. That's why I can challenge you. Bring two people this year. See what he does. Now, to get two people to come, you're going to invite ten. Because one of every five will come. And of those two who actually come, maybe one of them will accept him as Lord and Savior. So then you've got to go back and invite ten more, right? You see, you thought this is, I just invite two people and that's over. No, that's not over. That's the problem. We need to continue to boldly proclaim the gospel until every seat is filled again and again and again and again. Because people need the Lord. Men and women need Jesus. Number two. We live, when we live in the overflow, we live with the fear of God, not the fear of man. You need to read three chapters of Scripture, and I don't have time to do that this morning, to understand this premise. Start in Acts chapter 3, verse 1, and read through Acts chapter 5. Because in those chapters, you will come to understand what the fear of God really is. So many times, theologians tell us it is a respect for God. Can I tell you, that is diluted down, that is watered down, that's nowhere even close to what the Word of God really means in our hearts and in our life. The Bible uses the word fear at least 300 times in reference to God. 300 times in reference to God. So we downplay it, when we, so we make a mistake when we downplay the fear of God. The subject becomes even more difficult to untangle when we read passages like 1 John 4, 8 that says, in perfect love there is no fear. Well, how do we reconcile no fear to the believer with the fear of God in the believer's life? It becomes a difficult thing to understand, to unravel, and to apply. So let's talk about this. Scripture is full of examples that show the positive power of fearing God. That it's not a negative thing, it's a positive thing. Genesis 42, 18, Joseph's brothers trusted him because he said, I'm a God-fearing man. You can read it in Exodus 1, 17, the midwives feared God and as a result refused to slaughter the Hebrew children at Pharaoh's command. Pharaoh brought disaster on his entire nation because he did not fear God, Exodus 9. Moses chose leaders to help him based upon the fact that they feared God and wouldn't take bribes, Exodus 18, 21. The Mosaic law cites the fear of God as the reason to treat the disabled and the elderly very, very well. You can see it in Leviticus 19. And just so you don't think this fear of God is just an Old Testament idea, this is what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They can't touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Paul tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, we should work toward complete holiness because we fear God. So what does that term really mean? It means that we understand there is a God who created everything that there is. He is so far above us and beyond us, it's impossible to touch Him outside of the presence of His Son and the Holy Spirit. It means we understand we are accountable to a living God. You see, when we fear God, it changes the way we live our daily lives. So many believers don't understand that when you go to heaven, your salvation is not questioned. It's sealed and it's certain. But one day you will stand before the Bema seat of Jesus Christ and give account for everything you did for the kingdom after you received Him as Lord and Savior. When we understand that, it brings a heightened sense of accountability, a heightened sense of responsibility, and a healthy fear of God. 
So we have to understand it's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. Fearing God is good because it causes us to stem those sensual, sinful cravings that lead us astray. Romans chapter 3, probably the classic verse or chapter on sin. Paul says that the chief sin we have, verse 18 of chapter 3, is we have no fear of God at all. When we stop fearing God, we walk away. When we stop fearing God, we do what pleases us. When we stop fearing God, we say, there's no king in the land. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I'm going to do it my way. And I don't care how it affects anyone else. The longer I walk with God, the more convinced I become that God and the presence of God poses an ominous threat to my ego. An ominous threat to my ego. He rescues me from my delusions. He is able to lift me up after he casts me down. He sits in judgment of my sin, but forgives me nevertheless. When we begin to understand who he is and that he's worthy, not just of respect, not just of reverence, but he's worthy of our whole lives given to him 24-7, seven days a week. It never stops. We are accountable to the Most High God. That's why I can tell you, if you're going to live in the overflow, you better have a healthy respect of God. It's going to grow in you and flow through you as you understand who he is and what he wants you to do. The scripture says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The completion of that wisdom is knowing the love of God in your life. Because you fear him, you experience his love. And because you experience his love, rivers of living water should flow from your innermost being. Do I understand that concept? Do we grasp it this morning? We understand that God, more than anything, wants to reveal himself on planet Earth. He's done it time and time and time again. We call it revivals. And there have been great revivals through history that have stemmed sin, that have turned the tide of culture. Can I tell you, we are living in a day and in a time when we're about to experience the greatest move of God this earth has ever seen. Prior to his return, he's going to do everything he can to reach as many as possible. Why? Because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Oh, come on, folks, it's time to pray. It's time to believe. It's time to live as though we are in that overflow all the time and God is turning men to him. Time to change our attitude, change our perspective. It's not about religion. It's about flowing in the presence and the power of God. And when we stand in that place where we fear God, miracles become the norm. Everyday activity. Because God's presence is so heavy upon us that he touches hearts and changes lives. He heals sickness and disease. He sends demons to flight. Not because of us, but because of his presence flowing through us. Miracles become normal. And when we live in that place where we're living in the overflow and there's a healthy fear of God in our lives, prayer becomes our normal practice, not our occasional habit. Listen, if the only time you pray is when you come to this house, you're missing the boat. I told you earlier, everything that heaven has is available to you. You know how you receive it? You receive it by walking in relationship. How do you walk in relationship every day? By picking up this book, by saying, God, what do you have to say to me today? By listening to him, by asking him, by having a dialogue with him, by allowing Holy Spirit to speak into your heart and speak into your life, to lead you, guide you, and direct you. Oh, come on, folks, hear me. When we come to that place where we live in overflow and where we we come to that place where prayer becomes our habit, not the occasional practice. We will hear from God. We will see God move in our lives. We will stand and say, oh, taste and see, my God is good. We'll stand and say, let me tell you a story about what God has done for me. Let me tell you how wonderful, how powerful, how mighty my God really is. Someone said to me, I don't really understand you because... When you're preaching, there's no limp. You seem to have no pain. Let me tell you something. When the Holy Spirit anoints your life, all that stuff vanishes and goes away. It's just not an issue. 
Yeah, I can walk here without pain. I could hardly walk when I got out of bed this morning. But when God comes in and comes down, He empowers, He anoints, He infuses, He enables. Oh, come on, somebody. Don't you want to live in the overflow? Don't you want to live in the overflow? There is a difference when we choose to live in the overflow. When you read history, every great move of God started small, and then it got really big. When you look back to the history in America, from Azusa Street to Brownsville to Ontario, on and on you can go. It started small, and then it got really big. God's wanting to do something in you and me today. So I challenge you, start small, but dream big. Start small, but dream big. He is able to do, according to Paul, exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or even begin to think. Start small. Dream big. Live in the overflow for your life and then watch what God does through you to touch those around you. You see, there's a lot of us. We like to have a move of God as long as we're on the banks. Just don't put me in that river. But Ezekiel said, when he measured the first time, the water was to my ankles, then it was to my knees, and then it was a river, a river to swim in, a river that I could not pass over. Oh, come on. Will you get in faith with me and say, Lord, we're not happy with ankle-deep rivers. We're not happy with knee-deep rivers. Lord, we want a river we can swim in. We're willing to start small, but God, we're dreaming big today. We're seeing the house full. We're seeing souls saved. We're seeing people delivered. We're seeing people filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. We'll start small right here where we're at, but we're dreaming big. We're believing you for more than ever before because your word challenges us to do that. Your word confirms you move in a powerful way when we move in faith. So can I challenge you? Get off the bank. Quit being an observer. Get in the river. Get in the river. Get in the river. Because when you get in the river, the rivers of living water begin to flow. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed across this room. Tom, come back, please. You're in this room this morning. You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you were to die today, you would split hell wide open. There is no other alternative. You don't get a redo or a second chance. When this life ends, you will either spend hell, your eternity in hell or in heaven. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your eternity will be in hell, a place of torment, a place of destruction, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Horrible, more horrible than I can even begin to describe. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to show you reality. See, the church has painted a false picture for too long. We're all good. We're all going to get there. No, that's not true. Every man will spend eternity either in heaven or in hell. And what determines that is your acceptance or your rejection of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, His sacrifice at Calvary. You're here today and you say, Pastor, I don't want to spend eternity in hell. I want to accept Him as my Savior. I want to know that when I die, when my life ends, I'm going to be with Him forever. That's you right where you sit. Slip up your hand and say, pray for me. That's you. Yes, someone else. Yes, someone else. Yes, someone else. Yes. Others across this room. Yes, yes, others. Slip up your hand and pray for me. You'll join these six or seven or eight have already raised their hand. Yes, someone else. You want to know that you know that you know you're going to be with Jesus Christ. That's why Paul wrote, you have not been given the spirit of fear, but you've been given the spirit of adoption, whereby we call Abba Father. Anyone else? You'll raise your hand. That's me. Join these who already have. Everyone with your hand raised, lift your head, look directly at me. If you raise your hand, lift your head, look directly at me. No one else is looking around, just you six or seven. Right now, I'm going to ask you to do something bold, something strong, something that requires courage. I'm going to ask you to stand right where you're at and come and meet me right down here. Come on, right now, don't wait for anybody else. This is your turn, your opportunity. Do something bold for Jesus. Come on, step right down here with me. We're going to pray together. God's going to meet you in this room. Come on. That's it, young lady. Bring that baby with you. Come on. We're waiting for you. We're waiting for you. Today is the day your destiny is altered. Today is the day your name is written 
in the Lamb's book of life. Someone else you want to join us? Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but it's your time. Step out and come right now. That's you. Stand your feet with me across this room this morning, everyone. David, would you come and get ready? Stand your feet with me across this room. Yvonne, Ann, Amy, Cal, those elders and deacons here in the front, step up behind these folks, would you please? I want you to lay your hands on their shoulders. I'm going to lead them in the prayer. Then you pray with them specifically. Come right on over here, Edward. Diana Sheldon, come right on over here. Ezekiel, come here and stand behind these folks right here, please. So I want to talk to you personally right now. The Bible says if we believe in our heart on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with our mouth that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So I ask you today, do you believe in Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God? That he died for your sins, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. Do you believe that? Nod your head, say yes to me, let me know that you understand. Then the Bible says, if we confess with our mouth, we shall be saved. What are we going to confess? We're going to confess his lordship. We're going to confess our sins, and we're going to ask Him to forgive us. So right now, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. I cannot save myself. Please forgive me. Wash away my sins. Please come into my life. I receive you as my Lord. I accept you as my Savior. Change me. In Jesus' name I pray. Our prayer is that God will take this word and plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. Father, we pray for your great wisdom to infiltrate this listener, draw them to you, and take them gently down the road to their next destination in life. And if you're in need of a home church... We invite you to join us at Christian Heritage Church on Shera Road in Tallahassee, Florida. A multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. For a worship service where the presence of God has first place, you're invited to Christian Heritage Church. Sunday morning service is at 1030, Wednesday evening at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For all the latest information, visit our website chctoday.com